Welcome to the Think Space podcast with myself, John Stoskowski and Danny Massaro. Our goal with this podcast is a simple one. We discuss and dissect a prescient topic, issue or theme that we think is interesting and might help us humans better understand why we think, feel and do what we do. If you'd like to engage in these types of conversations too, you can check out thinkspace.academy for a unique cohort-based course that will help you think critically and live authentically. Hope you enjoy the episode. So, Jean-Paul Sartre is going to be the main focus of what we're covering today. We have spoken about him a little bit over the weeks in the different episodes that we've done, especially in relation to existential philosophy. So Sartre was one of the preeminent existentialist philosophers in France, novelist, playwright, political activist, and a really well-known, I think he actually won a Nobel Prize for literature in the 1960s. So he's a really well-known person in those days. The reason that we're talking about him today is one of his theories, Bad Faith, that we're going to look at. And the reason we're looking at that is a critical claim, really, of existentialist philosophy is that humans are essentially free. So we are free to make choices and we're free to guide our lives towards whatever goal that we've chosen. That's a key part of existentialist philosophy. There is a little bit of a caveat to that. So the existentialists, and Sartre in particular, do acknowledge what they call facticity which is basically the external circumstances that we find ourselves in as individuals. So where you're born, who you're born to, the era that you live in, the household that you live in, all those different external factors that you don't really play any, have any choice in, they're just external circumstances. The existentialists do acknowledge that facticity. However, for Sartre in particular, they still think that we have a choice. So even though we're maybe constrained in different ways, we still do have a choice for how we live our lives within those constraints. For example, if we if we say, or if you were to say, I cannot risk my life because I've got to support my family, or I can't quit my job because I've got I've got bills to pay, I've got to pay for my family. For Sartre, what you're essentially doing there is you're assuming the role of an object in the world, that's how he termed it, rather than a free agent. And for him, that kind of an attitude was ultimately self-deceiving which was a big part of of what we're going to talk about today which leads us to bad faith so bad faith for Sartre was where individuals essentially act inauthentically so we we almost yield to those external pressures that society encourages us to adopt so whether it's false values or behaviors we adopt those values and behaviors and we essentially disown our own freedom to make our own choices and, and follow our own path. That's what Sartre turned bad faith and what he saw as bad faith. So hopefully, Danny, that sets the scene a little bit. Where do you want to start? Well, one of the, the when I picked this up and really fascinated by it was uh, when he his famous example is is the waiter in the cafe that he used to sit in. You know, they were the existentialists were famous for having a jolly. You know, they were quite party animals and loved a good drink and uh, they were they were very social and a lot of the philosophizing was done in cafes in, in France. So they were always looking in their immediate environments for philosophy. So there was the, you know, existentially it's like studying the lived life rather than abstractly, you know, thinking about you know deeper concepts of, you know, what what how can we know what is truth and all the other philosoph- philosophical things. So this sort of continental philosophy, as they call it, uh, with European philosophy, was very much about, like, stuff that matters and counts in your life. So I like Sartre because he's very practically orientated. It's like, here's a bit of philosophy that you can go and do now in your life. You know, that obviously is 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 is, is, is the foundation of his philosophy because he... He was telling you basically as a human being, as soon as you're put into the world, you know you're responsible for yourself. You have a consciousness and you're aware of that. And that really in many cases in the world, quite young, you you know that you are free to choose your destiny. You are free. Now, unless you've been born a slave, or unless, and it, but, but even then, you know, even if you were born a slave, you've still got choices. You're know, human ultimately knows. And he was saying that that creates a lot of anxiety, that because you see, because you know that deep down, you have this, what he called angst. Um, and he wrote a book called Nausea 
all about all about that that you you are free to make options all the time one of the examples he used he said that famously that when you stand by the edge of a cliff and you sometimes get that that whoa that feeling you know he proposed that it wasn't the fact you felt that you could just fall off the cliff and, and slip and die it was the thought why am i not throwing myself off i could kill myself you know and some people have said that to me you know at times when as, as a joke like oh i was driving along the other day and i thought what's stopping me just crash my car now you know what what's holding me back then it, it, and that that's the responsibility you kind of have he, he tried to explain it that way that you you are responsible for so much stuff but people can't handle that it's too much responsibility and therefore slip into lifestyle roles where they can almost say it's not my responsibility i've just got to be this person and almost shut down that freedom so his example was the waiter and he said he, he, he was watching the waiter one day and he's in having a drink and studied him a little bit and watched what he did and he was almost like an automatic automatic robot and automate him his movements were a little bit precise he talked in a certain automatic way everything was you know his clothing was always the same he sort of shuffled along everything was just done to a, to, to an absolute precision that just like he was playing the role of a waiter he had this idea in his head of what a waiter is and this particular man who was the waiter sort of almost as well as getting in the clothes you know almost jumped into some sort of personality of the waiter and just came out and, and did that and we all know that don't we when we go for like coffees or restaurants well he i think Sartre called it being for others so our being for others and he is Sartre's waiter was essentially that wasn't it he's not being who he is he's being who he's expected to be and, um, so he's playing yeah, the role of waiter yet his consciousness is not that of a waiter he's still himself yeah assuming that role and acting that role so he's, his being is all for others he's not being himself yeah that's like the public you do a public ceremony of what is expected of you so it's the kind of thing where you would go if you are you know like you might you're with your friends you might say well you're my best friend so you should do this and they say, well, you're you're my best friend, so you should have done this. You know, you should have bought me a birthday card or you should have done this. And it's almost like you're not just two people who know each other. You've got these roles you should be. And it's a similar thing like with yeah, work and, 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 and customers. So, you, so you'll go to a restaurant and you expect a certain level of treatment and act to happen from the people serving you you know they should have a certain tone they should have a certain look they should come to you in a certain time they should approach the table in a certain way they should be apologetic this if things aren't because they are the servers and you are the customer so the customer is always right kind of role and Sartre was basically saying that's that's inauthentic that's people just playing it playing bad faith playing at games uh, and you know, or doing it automatically. Now he, he said, "Don't have a go at yourself for being authentic, and don't have a go at yourself." A lot of these things are functional. A lot of these, a lot of the, a lot of the ways you have to flip in. He said, "It's, it's no, it's no wonder we need to go into these roles because to be constantly authentic would be overwhelming." So, for the ease of life and for the flow of life, you do you do have to be for others because. You know, people expect things of you and you expect things of, of them and it's helpful and it makes the world slide along. However, he said there's a there's a tipping point. There's a point where you get so lost in that that you forget who you are yourself uh, to the point of you just basically become the act mainly in your life. So if you're a prof professional footballer, you just become the role of that professional footballer in everything you do. And sort of forget you're a person underneath or if you're a doctor it's the same or if you're you know if you call yourself a family man it's the same you know or the good wife the the dutiful daughter or the clever academic the nutty professor <laughs> you know whatever it happens to be you create a role and you almost just play that role out uh, and I'm sure that oh, that can link to personality theory as well and so on and self-identity and stuff like that so Sartre is definitely onto something here, and it intrigued me because you know you can you, when the existentialists talk, you always identify it in yourself first, and you think, God, I do that, and I do that there, and I do that there, and I do that, and I always sometimes think, Am I just being fake? That's not really what I think, you know. But why do I why do I put on that stupid voice when I do that? Why do I almost turn into this person when I when I do that? You see it in a lot of sports coaches who you help. 
there's that you, you talk to them and then they go on the pitch and do the coaching and they just bring on this kind of they walk a certain way they put the tracksuit on with their initials on because everybody that's what you're supposed to do they talk in a certain tone you know they shout in a certain way and i'm looking at them thinking that's not you and they've, they've without knowing it they've just jumped into this stereotypical role that they have in the heads of what a coach is rather than being themselves what do you think about because we've been talking about words recently haven't we with the so with the current cohort up here on think space last week we were talking about yeah or this week we've been talking about the use of words so like linguistics and misinterpretations and what just how we yeah. take meaning from language and one word that sartre uses when he's talking about this is he says that we're condemned to be free yeah so a lot of existential philosophy is that that's a core view of it, isn't it? That that man, human beings, are condemned to be free. Now, condemned is usually a, it has a negative connotation, doesn't it? That that's a ma- a massively negative thing for us as human beings mm. is that we're free, and that's an issue for us to deal with. Now, it reminded me of some of the research I did in the last few years with students, university students, talking about. For these couple of studies, I was exploring autonomy with them. So how much they value autonomy, how much they enjoy having autonomy, whether they felt they had autonomy or not. And the results from those couple of studies were overwhelmingly kind of positive, that they valued autonomy, they wanted as much of it as possible, and it was was really seen as a positive thing, which is the opposite of what Sartre is suggesting, where it's also you're condemned if you've got loads of autonomy over how you behave. So they really wanted that autonomy when they were given it on specific modules and assessments. They just like crumbled a lot of the time. And it was like, so they said they'd wanted it, but when you gave them it, they ended up, oh no, I need, you need to tell us what to do. I need, I need instruction. And it was very much, I wasn't looking through the, the lens of bad faith at the time, but it was very much like they wanted to, they, they resort, or the baseline is they resort to act in the role of students, which ultimately is your lecturer. I'm a student, give me what I need, you've got the knowledge, give it to me. Even though when you ask them before, it's like, no, no, I don't, I want to have loads of freedom in how I or what, how I approach an assessment, how I, well, just loads of freedom and choice, but when you give them, it's like, whoa, I don't want that. I don't, I don't know what you thought about that word condemned. How, how do you feel condemned that you've got loads of choice in how you live your life? Because I certainly see it as a positive. Yeah, I, like I, uh, it it depends how if you can hang out with yourself and live learn how to create your own authentic kind of rules about how you want to live. And if you can if you can get onto it, like I I left my job back in two thousand and five, my full time sort of what you might call your career job, your salary job. You know, the one that gets you the mortgage, the car, you know, the house, the you're properly on the way, gives you your status. It's the one that makes you think you've made it and, and blah, blah, blah. You know, it really gets you going in your 20s and, and early 30s. And then I just knocked it on the head. Now, I because I realised that, like, I don't have to do this for 25, 30 years. I had other options. You know, I I, I create. I, I don't want to do this. It's, I don't have to do this. Why am I just... And, and I remember one day thinking, gosh, I'm going in this building every day, even though I get a salary, and my wife is flying around the world playing squash. And, and I just had this epiphany. It was almost like I dropped her off at the airport and I just thought, what am I doing? I should be going with her. I thought, who says I have to just have a salary and an ego and a reputation and a you know like I was head of provision at the time it was quite a power thing I'd status at work I I, I, but I was really busy but it was like everything was stitched up you know I'm that's where I am I can shut down almost now just turn up for work and so on when you see students you know so I I took the jump a lot of people stayed stayed and in other things and so on and all the people who have now you can only do what you do. So I think that personally, for me, freedom means it's good. It's a good thing. I can handle that up to a point, you know, a, a real point. I like a little bit of structure, but as the years have gone by, more and more and more free. When I speak, see students and they're young and they're really concerned about playing the game, yeah, the game. We say that a lot. Oh, the student are at uni, they're playing the game. They come in, they work out how to pass the assessment. The uni says, if you come to our university and pass these assessments, you are clever. They're used to that because it's the same at school. 
if you do X, Y, and Z, you are a good boy, you are a good girl, and you are clever, and you get A stars. So there's a bad faith starting there, that you are clever if you do our rules and remember stuff in this exam. So it's just a very narrow form of bad faith intelligence that, you know, has its benefits, but also has its massive limitations. The school then puts the five A stars things, or, you know, A stars, high grades and on the on the school posters now don't they in the front of every school you have to have an advert why they're a good school with the grades and Ofsted basically everything becomes just do what you're told to do be a good person and you will make your way so by the time they get to university the mindset's in there so it's like do this do this do this and you'll get this and be a good person so when you then say to someone, no, we don't have really any assessments. Uh, we're just looking for, you know, self-led kind of interest. We're not going to get on your case if you don't hand things in. You know, there are no deadlines, just in your own time, guys. They just couldn't handle that level of freedom because they're programmed to play a game. And they literally say to you, no, please give me a deadline. So they're not learning for learning's sake. They're, they're in bad faith about learning. They're playing the role of a student. And not all students, and they all do it to certain degrees, but that's what, what happens. A lot of people, they switch off, then they can also they can also blame other things. One of Sartre's really good examples was the, was the woman who goes on a date with a guy, and he tries to, you know, they try to seduce, he, he tries to seduce her and so on. And he puts, she has her hand just on, on the table, and he puts his hand on her hand. Sartre said that she's got three options. She can pull her hand away, she can hold his hand tighter and bring him in closer and maybe, you know, and then that is a sign of that's allowed, I want that. Or she can freeze still and leave her hand there cold. And he called that option no option. He said that's that that that's that that's kind of not making a choice. That's basically saying I am gonna take it away or, or bring in close. So whatever happens, I'm blaming you. So she tried to deny the fact that she had a choice. So she just went, oh you know, and I, I think that's what a lot of people want. They don't want to have consequences to the choices. So they just go, what could I do about it? I, I had to pay my mortgage. What could I do about it? I, 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 you know, I'd have, I, you know me, I've never been self-motivated person. You know me, I've always liked chocolate. How can I stop eating chocolate? You know, these types of things. It's like, it's not even my choice. It's just something that's happened to me. Was it Sartre who one of his students came to see him and it was during the war, wasn't it? And I think he was part of the French resistance. This guy, or some of his mates were part of the French resistance. And he came to see Sartre and said, should I? I think it was along the lines of, should I leave university and go and join up the, and go and fight in the, in the war, essentially. And I can't, I'm trying to remember what Sartre said, but it was like a really, it was like a brutal answer of, how we should make this choice. Can you remember that or not? Yeah, I can. It, it was it was basically in the lines of there's not a right choice to that. There's no right answer to that question, which one should I do? But the, but you have to pick one. By You can't put it on your mum who says this and you can't put it on me to tell you what to do and you can't put it on your own inability to make a choice. Make a choice. There is no right answer. You, you know what I mean? He want, and, that, and that, that's like the, that's almost like this, and that's the core of his responsibility. So when I work with sports people or clients and things, using sort of existential bad faith as some sort of you know background scaffold, as which I might go in and try and help them. It, essentially, yeah, what you're doing, you're helping people handle the freedom, the responsibility. You 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 might say to them, you don't have to play, you know, today. You can you can enter the competition. Or you can go home. You can you can push yourself to uh, you know you, you you can choose. You, you don't ha- you can put. Oh, I have to play because of my sponsors. I have to play because everyone said no. You don't. You don't have to play. You are still making a choice. If you get on a run of five bad points, the next rally might be a chance to play really well. But you've gone in bad faith and gone. Oh, I'm not playing well today. You've, you've gone into a no man's land. You haven't just walked, you could have walked off the court there and then and said, you can have the match, I can't be bothered. That's fine. That's a positive action. That's the lady taking her hand away. Or you can jump into it and try and fix it. Or you can make no choice and you can just go, hey, oh, it's not my fault. Uh, just sort of stop trying and just be there. And that that is hard to do all the time. Sartre referred to that as we push our authenticity into the future. Because you reminded me of it when you talked about quitting quitting your job back in the day. And obviously I've done similar yeah. more recently where 
we've both essentially gone this path that we're expected to be on. It just wasn't authentic for us. So we yeah. we decided to make that change, which I'm sure, and just speaking to mates and, and, and people you know and people that you see over the years, I'm sure a lot of people feel that way, but don't make the move. And Sartre, he, he touched on that where he talks about pushing authenticity into the future, where it's we almost con ourselves to saying, you know, I'll be who I'm supposed to be someday. So we, we put it off into the future years rather than maybe taking that jump and going, no, do you know what? I'm feeling that sense of inauthenticity or I could be more authentic. Yeah, well, you, 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 was, you kick it down the road. I mean, that's the thing next year. Oh, I'll just have my holiday. Oh, I'll just get to Christmas, New Year's resolution. Oh, I'll do, oh, actually, it's not as bad as I thought. And this is what people, you know, you kick it down the road, the responsibility. And so Sartre has, you know, his, his, his famous thing, I always mention it on this podcast, don't I? You are, you are, you are, you are, you have your facticity and you have your transcendent self. So you're fully aware that you are a, of your potential all the time. You know, I could change this. You know, there are options. You know, I could be a different person. I could do this. Now, you don't want to go full, constantly, always in a transcendent mindset. Oh, one day when, you know, we'll, we'll, you know in a, if, when, when, I, when I get the money, when I get more time, when my kids grow up, you know, when I'm, you know, blah, 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 then I'll do it. You know, and you don't always want to be, I am what I am not yet. You don't always want to be, oh, I'm good, but I'm unhappy. You know, you, you're always going to be in that ambiguous state of like, am I living the fullest, best life as I could? Maybe I am, so I'll just stay put. If you're not, then maybe I need to do something about it. But equally, you don't want to get so stuck in the in the who you are and just the role that you never do anything that betters yourself. You don't, you know, and you've no ambition and you've no, you don't take leaps of faith. So just to stay, a lot. What a lot of people do is is they they find it difficult. They either get stuck in an extreme, so they either, they find it difficult to to go back and forward in that tension and live with that tension, that ambiguity of. There is something better for me than this. I'm pretty sure they're driving into work and they're going after, there is a better way for me. But quickly, they will they don't make a decision. They leave the hand there in, in the lady example. They won't go, you know what? No, I absolutely love what I'm doing. My life's the best. And, and like, you know, like go, and not, not, not to blackmail themselves or anything or lie to themselves, they genuinely start finding real quality in the current existence. Stop moaning about it. Let's do a great day. Let's get fit. Let's eat some good foods. Let's ring my parents. Let's get the relationships going. Let's speak to my wife, you know, and, and really re- instead they sort of stay in this sort of like frozen middle ground instead of being full on happy with what they've got and then making going, you know what, I'm going to change this and making like a full on confident, positive change where they go, I've just decided to change. It's like people get numb and stuck in the middle and scared to go either way rather than just accepting that you're going to sometimes feel stuck so embrace it and sometimes you need to you need to change your circumstances take on that responsibility and that's when i say to players and things like that when they're playing they all get stuck in that 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 drift mode of nothingness get either stay with your coach and do what they're telling you to do properly and appreciate them or change coach and do what and do something radically different you know, and do what they say, but don't get stuck in this might do, might not. Oh, should I, shouldn't I? Because you just go around the roundabout, stuck in a in a like bad faith that the universe is going to come along and something will happen and and it'll bail you out. Well, they were so Sartre. I know mentioned about how we're condemned to be free and the negative connotation of the word condemned, but for him and a lot of the existentialist philosophers, it is an optimistic outlook. So it's he calls it. Ex- existentialism is, is a doctrine of action so it is about it's it's realizing those moments and then like you said doing something about it so in that sense it is optimistic it's not a pessimistic or you know it's just because of the facticity i didn't choose this scenario it's not my fault i was born here and i've done this and that happened to me that's quite pessimistic isn't it whereas Sartre's was like no you are condemned to be free and that and that's like gives you an issue as a human being but you can do something about it. You can choose. It's a doctrine of action. So it's, I, I really like that about just the existentialist approach, really. It is a doctrine of action. It's not sitting and just thinking about it. And, oh, well, I could do that and I might have done that. You know, like we talked about in the, on the In the Moment episode. 
It's it's pragmatic and it's a basically Sartre is great and it appeals to a lot of younger people when the you know teens and late teens and so on because it is it's a very practical like he wants you to wake up you know come on wake up and do something about it like you can do it and never give up on yourself like so you might have had fifty years of bad faith of thinking that this was the thing you wanted to do all your life and one day it'll work. And then it's like, you don't have to keep going, holding on to that for the 51st year. You can go, you know what? That might've been wrong. You've got a choice to make. Am I going to do this now? That's happened. This is now. And I'm going to make that, that. you know, don't keep just replaying it and carrying on because it's been there. For, you can always, always choose at any moment to change. Even if it's your attitude, that's the thing. Even if it's your attitude on the situation you know links to the frankel thing doesn't it about creating your own meaning we talked about even in the prison camps you are free to choose your your attitude and that's that was a cornerstone of what sartre was getting at and he said his famous thing was that existence precedes essence in other words you define your existence by what you do not by what has been put on you you know, he did say that's limited, obviously, because, you know, we can't do certain things as humans that we mentally might think about doing, like flying or, you know, do, you know doing whatever, uh, being invisible, things like that. But it's, it, and, it, and also, like, you know, it, it would be hard for, for, for me to go and, you know, beat Tyson Fury in a boxing match and become heavyweight champion of the world. I ain't going to do it. I'm too small. So I have things about me that limit me, but I've still got a lot of choices I can make that affect my life for the better. And it is tough, John, because one of the things I've learned, that you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like that in a little bit in myself in nature anyway, what you might call a practical psychologist, a coach, you know, I've obviously like existentialism. It's no accident that, I, that it sings to me. And I found with a lot of my friends and a lot of people that I think one of the skills of, of that is being a friend to people, seeing that they're probably in a bit of bad faith and they're in a bit of these roles and they're just acting out things, but you can't keep diving in and telling them that they are because they can't handle that responsibility. You, you've got to be really careful. You don't take people's excuses off them. If they say, well, I can't because of this, this and this. You, you know, there's only so many times you might say, well, no, you don't have to. You could do it like this. You get very tetchy if you blow open their, their, their set bad faith stories and excuses as to why they can't change. Well, Sartre refers to that. He calls it a moving target. So authenticity, it's a moving target, which probably is something that appeals to me about it. There's no... There's no like destination, isn't there? Where you, you hit it and you go, that's it. I've hit peak authenticity now. This is me. I'm not in any bad faith. I don't know who I am, what I'm about, what I'm doing, and that's it. He was like, no, it's constantly moving. And the reason I think maybe some people don't like that is because it he talks about requiring honesty. So constantly doing that inward looking and that that being honest with yourself, wherever you find yourself and what you're doing, is quite discomforting because you never really get to that point of peace where it's like that's it I know now for the next 10 years I'm just going to do this and I am full on authentic and I'm, I'm, I've hit the jackpot that's never going to happen you can always think of examples in your own life can't you where even decades where you think like things are going to be defined your life in those years and it's totally different when you like the person you were then to the person you are now. and then like you said the person you will be We'll probably look back at ourselves here going, what were we doing now when we did that podcast? And it was like, yeah. You know, and you'll cringe a bit, won't you? But I think people like that certainty of if you follow a doctrine or a philosopher or a philosophy, it's like, right, or a religion, like we talked about with Camus, um, that intellectual suicide, you want just that piece of the answer. I found it. I know what I'm about. This is me now. I can forget all the like, introspection and the worrying and the wondering and I can just, just live in the moment. Like, again, like we've talked about in the past, but you can't. It's constantly a moving target that never, ever settle. You, you, you have to try and nip things in the bud when you clock it in yourself. Oh, I'm becoming, you know, I wrote a book called The Winning Parent and then for a few, you know, I promoted it, promoted it, and then I was becoming the winning parent guy. And I'm like, no, I ain't going down that hole. You know, people call me the psychologist guy in squash. You know, I'm not mainly a coach, but they all think I'm that. See, and it's how, how do you not play up to that role? You do a bit, don't you? Like we, we've done a podcast here and there's definitely elements of what podcasters do 
that we've just jumped into doing. Which we tried not to, if you remember. I was like, this is going to be the anti-podcast podcast. We're not having any intros. Yeah. We're not having like, any, and it was like, oh, if people listen to it and they were like, oh yeah, you're going to have to do that. You need to have this in there. But like, <laughs> we could become the anti-podcast podcast. But after three months, that's bad faith again. We're, we're, you know, that's playing the role of the punk, the rebellion person. There's no other way out of it. You've always got to make choices. You, you know, the moment that you think, ha ha, I've escaped that bad faith. I'm now a yoga teacher and I just go around eating off the streets and saving the planet. You're like, you, you, you start acting like that person that I'm the environmentalist. I'm the, you jump into a role. And you are always going to have a percentage of you because we do take our cues from the world around us and what's accepted. There's always going to be a percentage of you doing it because it's automatic and you just want to do it and you get used to it. You automatically just become that person, that that job, that role. You get up, you do it, you know the habits. And that's really useful, isn't it? You're functional, you serve, you, 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 your time, you, you're energy efficient. You almost go into robot mode and you just do it. But it's how much of that do you want to keep doing? And then, you know, people get on holiday, don't they? Or they have COVID and they have time off and they come down and they snap out of it and it's revealed. They look at their life from a bit more of a distance and they go, what am I actually doing? Or Heidegger was one, wasn't he, about the being towards death? He said that death is the only time you truly look at as you approach, you know, on your deathbed, you always think of your life in a completely holistic, different way. And, and my go, what did I do with my time? What an idiot. It's only then that the true reasons and meaning for why you were there, but you can't do anything about it then. So he suggested you visit graveyards <laughs> a bit more often and remind yourself that you are, you are going to die one day. So snap out of it. And I thought about that from a midlife crisis point of view, you know, you know, why a midlife crisis, in a way, is so bad? Well, they're bad because people snap out of the, the conforming roles that they've been playing as a husband, as a wife, as a, you know, whatever. But only, only that person will know if they've gone from one form of bad faith into another form of bad faith, which is, right, now I'm going to buy a Ferrari, leave my wife, do this, do as if that's heaven, you know, that's as if that's the thing to do and not this. So, you know, it's it, it, it's like, I like Heidegger's thing there of like, wake up because you're not here for long and make some genuine choices. You've always got a choice and you're, and you're, and you're you know, you're responsible for that choice. Heidegger called it more like fallenness when you just slip into, oh, I've got to do this because and all these shoulds and I should, you know, and, I, and this was... He, call, he says you've fallen a little bit from your existentiality there. You've passed the book, you've passed the blame. But who's trying to say, no, you, you know, you've got to wake up a bit more than that. I think that narrative comes into it as well, though. So, look, part of Sartre's thing was becoming, we become who we are through the stories we tell ourselves. And life, because it's lived along a timeline, isn't it? That's all, that's, that tends to be how we maybe not justify, but explain the choices we made and the decisions we made. It's like a narrative of you're creating this story. And Sartre used that word condemned again, where he said we are condemned to view our lives as stories and for our lives to have a narrative that makes sense. So we have to have it make sense, don't we? It can't. So maybe a midlife crisis, cause some of that could be that the narrative just isn't now making sense. And it's like, I need to rebel or I need to massively, it's like a plot twist, isn't it, in, any, in a film? If that's how you're viewing your life, all these different scenarios that you've been in and things you've done, it's like, like plot twist, here we go, and I'm going to make a big shift. But I find that interesting that we do, we, we look back, so maybe that's what Heidi was getting at as well. We look back and try to yeah. make that justification for what we did, and if you can't, that's got to be brutal on your deathbed, hasn't it? When you think it's like, yeah, I didn't live authentically. I didn't need to make that choice. People, the time passes by, they'll do, they go, oh, God, I 60 years I did, and they only gave me a bit of a clock or a pension, you know, and they're like, as if they were, they were bad faith. They thought that by staying so long, someone somewhere were going to say, you're this. You know, when, when if you're an athlete, or you know, and you think, you, you, you can be in bad faith thinking that when I become world champion or world number one, then this will happen. And it's like, no, it doesn't. I mean, it's good, but you've still got to get up in the morning. You know, you've still got to get up next day and, and make choices. You can't, you can't, you can't world champion your way out of it. 
you know, you can't become a billionaire and then like be like, well, here I am in constant existential bliss. It's just, what do I do with all my money now? Who's hunting me? Who's how much tax? Well, that's not fair. And you just, you know, in a way, problems create more problems. I first came across, across Sartre, it was reading Eckhart Tolle. He brought him up a lot in his Power of Now and, and, uh, and his uh, A New Earth book and stuff. And he was talking a bit more about the ego and about how you jump into automatic roles that way. And he was talking about, like, for example, with your parents and, and how you put people, you put your parents, you, like, you're my mum, so you should do this, as if she's got 10 automatic jobs that are bestowed on all mums no matter what. And then she goes, well, you're my son, so you should do this. You might not actually like each other, you know what I mean? It's like, no, you, you have to like your family because it's, it's blah, blah, blah. And he was kind of saying, well, why, why, why do you have to? You just might not. You came through each other. In, you came through your mum into the world. It doesn't mean she owns you or you own her. You, you, you're separate people. And in some ways, I found that really good. I found that like a bit freeing from the roles, the, the bad faith roles of you're my family, so automatically you all just think I'm amazing and you love me. I mean, that's just not true. That's, that's bad, bad faith. Another form of bad faith talked about might be going to church all the time thinking if I'm a good person on earth I will go to a heaven which was Nietzsche's slave morality type thinking as well you know all in the same ballpark you're a slave you're stuck you, you can't get out of it so you, you've got to fabricate this idea that you will be better in the afterlife you know because it helps you cope and I think that I've seen that a lot with, with like athletes and people at work. They work and they work and they work and they almost as if they will be rewarded down the line, not just, you know, in, in money and things, but in, in actual almost spiritual ways. I've been, you know, a good person, good person, done all this stuff that's right. So I am old. I deserve something to come for me. Now, again, that's like Sartre would say, that's a little bit of bad faith again. Camus would say you're being absurd with that because there's no such thing as fairness in the world. It's absurd. In a way, what the existentialist thing sort of says is take it day by day, to, you know, take it more day by day and, and, and don't, don't just jump into roles like, or don't take people for granted as well, you know, because they could be gone tomorrow type thing. So you know, your, your best friend or your, your people that mean things to you, don't just automatically presume that they're always going to, be there for you or always going to rescue you you know you might try to see them more as an actual person rather than just the role of the, my best friend i've definitely had helped that's helped my relationships with players and people and so on I, I i do jump straight away to oh well that's a client for example that i'm a sports psychologist or i'm a, and they're a client and i go well i'm then I'm miles better when I remember, oh, no, no, that's that person called, you know, Sarah, and she's a person in the world who's unique, and I'm a person called Danny, and I'm a person in the world that's unique, and we're just trying, and we're just two people talking to each other today, helping each other a bit. It helps me get to the more of, I think that's what helps a bit more than I'm a sports psychologist, you're a client. And you sort of go on some autopilot sports psychology trip. I think, well, I was trying to think of times when I felt real, like, gut level, bad faith, where you, you just know you've been inauthentic. The idea that springs to mind for me was back back in the early days of teaching, where you remember, like, it would be more like you'd do, like, a big lecture. So you'd have, say, I don't know, 150 people in a lecture theatre. And back then, you'd do, like, a 50-minute lecture, and then it might be four seminars back to back, wouldn't it? Where you'd essentially just deliver the same seminar yes. four times, but with different groups who would come in. And I used to absolutely despise that because I was all about in the moment, like you do a lecture and that lecture is that lecture, the way you deliver it. Then you do a seminar and that seminar is that seminar. But then the thought that you had to repeat it, that's when I'm thinking back, I was just acting the role of the lecture in that thing. Because it's not then you're covering what you've got to cover because you covered it the last time. Yeah, there's there's little tweaks and that that you make. Just you think, oh, I'll do that different that time because it'll work better this way or whatever. But essentially, you still, and I used to hear, I was like, oh my God, this isn't like back-to-back seminars used to kill me because I just felt like I was acting that that role. And it reminded me of, I think I was telling you the other day, me and my mate, we used to love gigging. So we'd go and watch loads of bands, like back in the, like, 
late 90s, early 2000s, loads of different bands all over the country, and we used to absolutely buzz off it. And the more and more that we went, I started getting this sense of, and I think that's what I was feeling when I was talking about lecturing them. Say they're on like the seventh night or the seventh venue of a, I don't know, like a 20 gig tour or something. By that point, they don't care which city they're in or which venue they're in. They're just doing the set list and it's like they're on autopilot, aren't they? Because no one likes doing the same stuff over and over and over again. But to them, it is. They're just, and then, you know, you'd get certain artists who'd have particular big songs, wouldn't they? The audience just wanted to play that one or two songs because they're the big ones that they can also belong to. And you know, like musicians are like, oh, I'm going to play you this B side off, whatever single, or I'm going to play you a new song. And you can feel the crowd like, oh, just give us the like, give us the good stuff that we normally want. And they, I used to think, like, they don't want to be here. They're just doing this because it's their job. So they're now acting the role of that band or that musician. Well, that that's no different to, I think, and this is with Sartre, what would Sartre say there, perhaps? You, that's no different to, like, a hairdresser. That's no different to a, a bricklayer. Yeah. That's no different to a nurse, a GP, you know, a teacher. You got, you, you, you know, like you've said. I think the diff, I think the thing is... And Billy Connolly was good at this in his autobiography. I just read that he would do he would do it in his style, and therefore, even if he told the same joke, he could notice the difference in it. He'd tell it a different way. He'd be in a he'd notice that he was in a different auditorium. He used to walk a lot around the the venues. He'd go and meet the local shops. He'd try and make every night he did as unique as he could. In other words, he'd stay awake as much as he could. That's Billy Connolly. And that's why maybe part of the reason he's loved it and he's successful and he's out there and that's part of his thing. You know, a total everyman type person. I suppose Sartre would say, even in your lecture situation there, you maybe slipped into a bit of bad faith for whatever reason at the time. I'm a teacher, you're students, and couldn't and failed to see, even failed to see the, the variance, you know, the difference that was going on. It's, it's like same but different. So you saw, saw you saw a lot of the sameness, but it wasn't different enough, is what I would say. Yeah, but the, but the wood actually, Sartre would say you would be able to find enough difference if that was your at your predicament. So you could you could find a world of difference in one person. Never mind another twelve people walking in. He 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 would he, you know you you could have changed the chairs around. You could have had a break. You could have gone started back to front with the topic. You there would have been enough attitudinal variance there for you to not do that one in or no less bad faith you know less less boredom and i think that's what is a skill in life you know if an if you're a footballer and you're playing another match in another match and you go oh my god we're back on the bus again and we do if i wasn't like that i would not be doing this podcast with you again <laughs> no you know we pick a different topic but you know so that so it's like it, it's yeah, I, you know, can, can you find the variety and the differences and the authenticity in the day if that is your predicament that you're in? It doesn't. Let, bad faith doesn't last mean you've got to be jumping constantly from this project to this to this to this, and then that's the only way you can not be in bad faith. It's almost like do what you do, but do it, find the do it for the make a choice every time you're doing it. Sometimes I'll go to coach people, and it slips in my head. Oh God, coaching Dave again. Every week now for eight years, he's never got any better. He's sixty-seven, you know. And I go, and I just, I just automatically go, shut up. It's brilliant with Dave. He's always funny. We all, something always happens. I love this drive. I might drive a different way to the club. I might start the session off there. And I just make, I try and make it as like new as I can uh, for my own sake. That's why, the, ironically, I think that's why the bugger keeps coming back. <laughs> I hope he's not listening to this. Good, eh? I, it reminded me when you mentioned Billy Connolly, actually. I can't remember who the comedian was, but I remember seeing a comedian live and there'd been this really funny moment in there where it was like really like ad libby and yeah. um, you just felt he'd yeah. gone off script a bit because they, they've got a set, haven't they, that, 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 an act essentially that they're going through, but it went a bit ad libby and you thought, oh, this is like he's gone off script. It's genuine. And I remember seeing the DVD of that too. Yeah. 
like a totally different venue, and it was the same. So you're like the bastards, even the bloody like that's still planned. It's like Billy Connolly was at the Opera House in Sydney, and the guy who came to see him, my best show I've ever seen. And he said, so how do you do it again that tomorrow night? How do you remember it all? He says, I make it up on the spot. I said, I don't have any scripts. He says, right, bet. You cannot do tomorrow night and not do anything you did tonight. And he went, I can. And he did. He did, he, he did the next night and there was nothing in it from the night before. He was unique, I think, Billy Connolly, wasn't it? Well, that's what Billy Connolly was saying. He, if you read his life story, he was, he was never a, a conformist. He was always thinking on his feet anyway. He was all... He, he, he's, his book's called Windswept and Interesting, and, you know, and he said you can't. He said the moment that you want to be a windswept and interesting person, you've you've cocked up. He said because you've already identified it as a as a form of being that you want to be. He said you 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 you, you just stumble into it because it's your personality. You find it, you don't become it in terms of like right. I want to be a punk, so you start dressing. He says you just you either are it or you're not, and you just you just live your life that way. So you do come across these sort of ex, you know eccentrics are often not too much in bad faith because they're a bit more like on the cusp of life. But yet you, you know the difference between a true eccentric person who's just lost in their own worlds, you know, and you think wow they're out there, and you know the people that are trying to act eccentric because it's like a bit trendy to be that way, and that's the that's the thing, isn't it? You tend to you tend to feel it and smell it off people when they are in bad faith with things and doing it for those types of reasons than like doing exactly the same behaviours, but you're just like, now nah, they're just dead genuine. So you can watch The Only Way is Essex and it might be not your cup of tea, but you can see the ones acting Essexy and you can see the ones that are just no idea what they're doing. They're just from Essex and they're just being themselves. It's like the wrestling. Remember the wrestling back in the day? Yeah. That used to be my favourite thing. I'd watch with my granddad on a Saturday afternoon when it was like Big Daddy and Giant Haystacks and like the original crew. And I still wonder actually, did he did he genuinely think that was real or did he know? Because I was all in. I thought this is proper. Yeah. He's like knocking 10 bells out of his proper thing. Yeah. So when I got a bit older, it's a bit like Santa, isn't it? And then you realise, oh, it's like just choreographed, like, and it looks dead obvious. But as a kid, I used to buzz off that. And then I, I did, I thought back and was like, wonder if he, was he in on it? Did he know and he was just give it the buzz because I buzzed off him and it was our thing that we did? Or did he genuinely think it wasn't and it was just real life as well? I don't know. I was reading a study yesterday, actually, that made me think of this. It was, they'd done a study of these psychiatrists and they were looking at antidepressant prescriptions. And it was basically like when a patient presents with certain symptoms or whatever, uh, would, they, would they basically put them on antidepressants? Essentially, the comparison was, would they take them themselves? And the graph was just like totally different. So they, they would be willing, or not willing, they would prescribe these antidepressants to the patients. But if it was themselves with the same symptoms, they wouldn't. And that made me think about you know, that. That's massive bad faith, isn't it? Where it's like they're, they're giving stuff to people that they wouldn't do themselves if they were in the same situation. And is that because they're just playing a role, they're acting the role of a psychiatrist? Yeah. I think I think that's interesting in itself. When when people try and hijack, they get onto fads and they hijack like their bodies. You know, they'll they'll put their faith into something that's new and the new diet. You know, the Wim Hof stuff we've seen at the moment with the breathing and the cold, you know, all this. It's like a fad, regardless that the guy looks about 90. Uh, um, but it's a fad. And suddenly you're like, oh, right. So if I start doing that, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, that, that will, you put the faith in it. That will, that will save me. That will rescue me. I won't really have to change what's going on, like, properly. I'll just start this new diet. I'll start eating vitamins. I'll take antidepressants. I'll do this. Now I know there's a there's a play level to that. There's an experimental. Oh, let, well, let's try these antidepressants. See how they go because I'm struggling. Or oh, let's try some of this deep breathing. It looks interesting. You know, there's a I'm gonna there's an experimental. Let's let's find out for myself. But then there's these people that just go give me the pills or I'm going full Wim Hof now for a year or I'm going full Joe Wicks. Or I'm going to do, you know, I'm going to, I'm a vegan. Yeah, that's going to sort me out for it. That's going to give me a purpose and a cause. And, and, and I'm going to be, you know, so people just go into things like religions in bad faith. 
And I think that's that's the thing. I, you know, you get it when you're successful in in, in areas. You know, I'll, I'll, sometimes I'll people ring ring you up as a coach or something, or and they just ring you, and you know they think you're going to fix them. They think, oh, I'll just go to him; he'll sort me out. And you're like, you've got absolutely no chance. Yeah. Who do you think I have? A magic wand? You know, it's like, <laughs> you know, people, the people that pass the book. People do it with holidays and 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 goals. These areas of my life aren't brilliant, so I'll I'll, I'll, I'll just ignore that. I'm not going to do anything about it because that would take a lot of action and some consequences and this temporary discomfort. What I am going to do though is go to Disney for three weeks in summer, and that's my reason to live. And it almost becomes like the mecca thing that keeps you going. We've done that with Christmas, haven't we? A lot, you know. Christmas is 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 almost become this thing now that's like get to Christmas time. It's because it's so massive. You're more massive and consumerist than ever. It's like as long as I can have my summer holiday and Christmas, that I can put up with a sh- with all the shit all year type type thing. That holiday, that time's gonna make it all worthwhile. I see people do weddings, don't they? They they, they get married for the wedding. And Sartre talked about that in relationships, didn't he? As well, he said, "You, you when you're in the honeymoon bit, or you, you, you're thinking of the idea of when we get married, everything will be fine. You know things about each other, and you know it ain't going to work. But then, when the divorce happens after the marriage, when it all falls down, you blame the other person. When all along, you probably you knew deep down, you know, you just look the other way type thing. So they're all little little forms of bad faith. And for me to summarize, why why you know, as a as a sort of psychologist, philosopher who tries to help people and educate as well, I just find Sartre really interesting because it's it's like in the world stuff. It's like in your life. It's stuff we can all resonate with. And he was on to us. He wasn't completely right. And there's many criticisms of Sartre. You know, he 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 was on to he was on to us. He knew he, he kind of knew what we were up to. <laughs> sneakily I, I I think I don't think it's totally healthy to think that everything is down to you completely that's why the absurdist stuff I like where things do come in from the outside you do have bad luck there are things you, you that are dutiful and good about service and, and there are there are you know disciplines and things and it can't always Sartre was criticized for it being a very selfish philosophy the Beauvoir took it on into saying how you could be more for others in an, in a better way than how Sartre put it. But ultimately, it's definitely worth looking at. Um, there's so many interpretations of it. The original book, Being a Nothingness, is dense and it's too hard to read and it's you know, for a lot of people, so I wouldn't go there. But, you know, there's tons of stuff on the internet about bad faith and articles. Yeah, I think for me, it, it ties in with the, the episode we did on Mimetic Desire quite a lot. And another th- another thing that Sartre did talk was how our sense. So I mentioned about narrative. How much of our sense of self or our sense of ourselves comes from other people? So you just mentioned there about holidays, and it popped into my head about. Remember back in the day, you'd just go into a travel agent in per in person, wouldn't you? You'd sit down and you'd say, "I want to go somewhere warm and sunny." And they'd show you the, they'd turn the screen and show you, wouldn't they? Yeah, yeah. And it might be a brochure, <laughs> where they'd be like, oh, yeah, and it would be a picture of the pool. And, yeah. and that, yeah, you'd book a holiday off the back of that. Yeah. And you'd go and you'd just have a good time, wouldn't you? Yeah. Whereas now, and it, I'm trying to link this back to that, we're condemned to be free. We don't book anything. Everything, we're looking at a million reviews before you do anything. It's like, oh, there's this thing on TripAdvisor and, you know, it's got a thousand reviews and this, this and that. And we tend to go to have the holiday that we've been told we're going to have by all these other people. We're not authentically living that holiday like we maybe would have done back in the day. And so for me, it does, this stuff just shines a light on how much of your life is genuinely you making those choices, you know, embracing that freedom that we've got, seeing it as a that doctrine of action. So it's optimistic and it's got, I've got all these like potential things I could do and tuning into what you want to do rather than just, am I doing like the mimetic desire thing? Am I wanting what other people want? Yeah. Am I acting the role of someone who's going to go to say, book a holiday to Paris? And then it's like, right, where are all the sites in Paris? And you tick them off and you go and you look at them and you're seeing it. You know, you've seen it all on the internet. You've seen what they all look like. Why do you then have to go and just tick it off? Yeah, maybe people are booking destinations now as potential Instagram moments. Which one's going to give me most kudos, you know, when I'm 
and I'm there with a tan and, and I've got the Eiffel Tower, you know, whatever. I, you know what I mean? It's a script. I'm just genuinely visiting the tower because it's like, wow, I'd really just saw it in, a, in when I was a kid at school and I just wanted to go there and feel it and go for a day. It's, it's almost like it's the idea of it rather than doing it. Yeah, like booking a holiday and just going away. It's like, well, I'll be fine. There'll be people there and it'll be yeah. sunny and we'll have a laugh. It's, it's, it's gone beyond that now, hasn't it? It has to be a lot more. No, this has to be perfect. And, and it all has to have this, this, and this because you're putting so much stock in it to rescue you from all the other mundane stuff, maybe, of your everydayness. And then maybe that's where we demand that bad faith in others. So you go to a hot. So you go to a hotel yeah. and you've been told, oh, this is what the staff are like. And there was this guy on the pool and he was brilliant. You get your towel every morning. And there was this waiter in the thing who used to love the kids. And it was like, so you then go and you expect that same experience that other people have because you're living, in, you're living through other people. So that, that for me is probably the biggest conclusion of the bad faith stuff. It, it's a little check and challenge, isn't it? It's... How much of what you do is genuinely a true representation of what you want to be doing at that face value level? Are you succumbing to some of those societal influences and you may be assigning your, your your freedom to other people? You just like a bit like Camus used to talk about. I think I admire people who who show courage and make a leap of faith, shall we say, is whatever that is. And you can never knock them for for, for that um, unless they unless they do it in some like silly over the top conceptual way. Oh, I'm just going to open a cafe now, and and I'm you know and, 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 you know it's like well, fair play. You've you've tried to change the situation, but you've really really got to love it. You're going to have to work hard. You're going to have to get up every day. It's going to truly have to be what you really genuinely want to do. And I think that's the hard part for people. I think it's a bit of a middle no man's land where they don't even know that they want to do the other thing in their bones. For you know, I knew I wanted to go around the world coaching squash with my wife. I just knew I wanted to do it. So it was easier for me to leave one thing. It wasn't like I needed to get out. I just moved to a positive in my mind. I think you've got to generate some real positives and that's the mimetic desire stuff we did like what is your one true desire what is your main thick real desire what you would love to be doing every day properly that's that takes some considering and then it takes an obviously a practical leap of faith that that's just for me really vital and always i'm always saying to people that in in sports you don't have to do this if you don't want to do it stop do something else and as Sartre said, stop making excuses. So your facticity, your facticity gives you a little bit of constraint, but ultimately you're not an object in the world in this situation. You have got choice, be your own, you know, you can make your own destiny. It's funny, people will tell that to the children all the time, that they can't, can't do it for themselves too so easily. It's hard, isn't it? It's hard, it's not easy, but you, you, you know, you can definitely do it. <laughs>